It's a great privilege to be starting off this conference and I am very grateful to Alina and the other organizers for putting it together. I'm very grateful for having been invited to talk. So I was initially asked to talk on uh, the dependence of life histories on body size and temperature. Uh, but this, as you'll see in a moment, this raises the question as to what are the physiological constraints on vital rates? Why can't we grow faster? Why can't we have more offspring? Why can't we live for longer? What's stopping us? It's something physiological in part. So what are the physiological constraints? So that's the major theme of the talk. And um, uh, hold on a moment. Why can't I get to the next slide? So the structure of the talk is, uh, it's the talk's in three parts. So it begins with, how does natural selection act on life histories? And then I go on to these physiolo physiological constraints. Uh, what are they? And then the last part I've been working on very recently, why does growth slow? Why does juvenile growth slow up? as animals approach maturity. What are the physiological constraints on juvenile growth? Okay, <clears throat> so those are the three parts of the talk. So we'll start off with natural selection. So this is work I did oh, way back when with Peter Kahlo, we put it together in a book in 1986, largely Peter's instigation and Peter wrote most of the book, to be honest. Uh, but um, anyway, the, 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 the heart of all this is, uh, if you're th talking about natural selection, well, you want to know how natural selection acts. And you need to be able to measure, at least in principle, the Darwinian fitness of a gene. And fitness is measured as the rate at which the number of copies of the gene increases. And that's measured as the percent increase per year, rather like this wretched virus, we're interested in the percent in increase per week. So percent increase per year. So that's going to be the measure of uh, fitness, but the value of fitness depends on the, 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 the properties of the carriers of the gene. I use gene and allele synonymously here. So if we think of the time scale during the life history, uh, we're born here and then at this point, uh, we first reproduce, we produce N offsprings, gone slightly uh, out of uh, alignment here, but we produce N offspring. And then in a simplified model, we can produce N offspring uh, uh, periodically throughout life, potentially forever. And this life history has a time period, so a time interval Tj for the development period of the juvenile and then the adult Ta, that's the period between reproductive events. Ta, 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 Ta. And then mortality rates, this is a simplified model, but for the juveniles, they've got a constant mu j mortality rate and the adults constant mu a mortality rate. So, um, oh dear, yes, we get this terrible equation. So what this does, it's, it's, the, it's the euler lotka equation, to be technical, which shows uh, for this simplified life cycle, how Darwinian fitness F depends on all those uh, properties of the carrier, carriers of the allele. So, there was N and there was mu J and there was TJ and so on. So this is a rather unpleasant equation. I think you will all agree. But in principle, it shows, it does show uh, the dependence of fitness on these uh, life history properties. And the key thing that comes out of all this is actually very intuitive that other things being equal, I'll come back to that. Other things being equal, the best thing to do is breed as early as possible. Each time you breed, produce as many offspring as possible. And throughout all of this, 
minimize your death rate per unit time. Now those are, that's the optimal thing to do. Genes are selected to do all of that, other things being equal. So what other things being equal means is there are no trade-offs. And so in reality, of course, if you try to breed earlier and earlier, then you take risks. So you take risks, so your juvenile death rate goes up. So there's a trade-off there between breeding earlier and minimizing mortality rates. So this just shows what you do in the absence of trade-offs. So that's the life history part of the talk. And I want to go on to consider the constraints that mean you can't do all these things that you'd like to do. And I'm going to talk mainly about the constraints imposed by body size. So why is it that larger animals can't breed as early as uh, small animals, for example? And the way I'm going to start talking about this is in terms of Kleiber's law, which I guess nowadays everyone will be familiar with. This is an early representation. You look at the metabolic rate, that's the power available to the organism to grow and to reproduce and so on. And that scales with body mass, adult body mass. And you plot out different organisms and you get uh, the body mass depends on mass to the three-quarter power. The three-quarter power. There's been immense debate, is it really three-quarters or not? And uh, we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, so that was the starting point of work 25 years ago. Came, came to fruition in this article by Jeff West and Jim Brown and Brian Enquist. A general model, a theoretical model for these scaling laws. And it was this paper that eventually gave rise to the field which became known as metabolic ecology. And Jim and his wife and I put together a book showing where metabolic, metabolic ecology had got to by the, the year 2012. So, um, how does this theory work? Well, it's essentially very simple. This shows a lung, uh, you've got the, the windpipe and it splits, it splits again and splits all the way down to the alveoli, uh, where, which is where oxygen, oxygen diffuses across into the uh, blood vessels. So the business end is down at the alveoli, but you've got all this infrastructure, all this branching process infrastructure, and that takes up a lot of space. And the bigger you are, the, the more infrastructure there is. If you're very tiny, you don't have to have all this branching going on. And so it's that which, um, in their theory, gives rise to Kleiber's law. And um, it was one of the big disappointments of my whole career to realize the maths in their explanation is wrong. It actually gives rise to mass to the two thirds, not mass to the three quarters. So that is a big disappointment. But um, another way to look at it is I measure the success of a scientific theory in large part by the volume of empirical work that it elicits. And judged in that way, this is a hugely successful theory because there's been hundreds of studies following up various aspects of um, the, the West et al. theory. And one of the early, uh, early analyses looked at mass-specific metabolic rate in relation to body mass. We do it mass specific so we can compare big animals with small animals, big animals with small animals on, <clears throat> on a per gram basis. And that means we can look at the efficiency of the organism on a per gram basis. And looked at uh, uh, on a per gram basis, you can see that big animals are doing 
quite a lot worse than the small animals. And actually the curve here does turn out, well, it's, it's a per gram basis, so the three quarters uh, transforms to minus a quarter. So the efficiency in my sense of the big animals is much lower than that of the small animals. The mass specific metabolic rate is lower for the big animals and for the small animals. One of the most important pieces of evidence that all this depends on body size is this remarkable study in which <coughs> you take cells out of the body. Here they are in the body in the blue, blue, blue circles. You take them out of the body in vitro. And in vitro, the cells from the big animals down here, uh, they have, they're just as efficient. The metabolic rate per cell is just the same as the small animals. So to me, this is very powerful empirical evidence that there is a constraint just as a result of body size. Put, them, put those cells back in the organism, then the, their efficiency has gone way down. I'm now going to turn to the consequences for the life history. So the life history, I'm going to talk in terms of productivity. So productivity is going to be, uh, for, the, for reproduction, it's the reproductive biomass produced per year divided by mum's mass. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm dividing by mum's mass so I can put it on a gram for gram basis, a per gram basis. So it's productivity is per gram. So one of the first papers I did with Jim Brown was looking at the productivity of placental mammals. And <coughs> you can see here that um, it doesn't go down actually as mass to the minus quarter but it does go down and these are different uh, animal groups have fitted parallel lines through the data from the different groups and we Jim actually provided wonderful interpretations of why it is that the green points they're the grazing they're the herbivores the artiodactyls and the seals in light blue and the cetaceans the whales in dark blue, they have relatively high productivity uh, compared, for instance, with in red, we've got uh, the terrestrial carnivores. And uh, what have we got down here? We've got the bats down here. And Jim was able to provide these uh, wonderful interpretations in terms of the lifestyle of the organisms. But I haven't really got time to go into what those interpretations were. Uh, because I'm giving a rather broad brush overview in the time available. So if we go on, a later study looked at uh, comparing the placentals, which are now in light grey, with the marsupials, which were the solid circles, and we've got a monotreme or two in, the, in these uh, unfilled circles. And what we find, which is extraordinary, to me is that the slopes of the lines are indistinguishable, uh, statistically indistinguishable. And then if we go on to uh, birds, now the birds, ha, we don't even have a straight line relationship here, it's curvilinear. Again, we split out the different groups to, to some extent. Uh, we've got uh, in green, light green, we've got the waterfowl, the anseriforms, and they're very productive, of course they're precocious, and so one can again give an interpretation in terms of lifestyle. Then down, uh, now I'm trying to try and not get mixed up, well, down here in these, uh, these honey-coloured crosses, we've got the songbirds, and here we've got the hummingbirds, and they're uh, relatively low and again Jim uh, produced uh, wonderful lifestyle interpretations of this but it's remarkable here that we don't actually have a straight line it's 
without doubt curvilinear. So uh, we have also looked at uh, reptiles, that's a less straightforward story, but again there's a negative relationship. So now I'm going to go on to juveniles and we'll start with um, the allocation. We've been talking about the way input is allocated to reproduction. Uh, now we'll turn to, to growth, juvenile growth. <clears throat> I'm going to use essentially the same productivity measure as before. So productivity is going to be measured as percent, that's putting it on a per gram basis, if you like, percent biomass increase per year. And when we're looking at uh, juvenile growth, one of our early studies <coughs> six years ago compare, compared the biomass production, the productivity of juveniles in the top panel with the productivity of the adults, which we've seen before for the placental mammals. So these are placental mammals. And the remarkable thing is that the patterns are, they're not, not quite identical, but they're, they're very similar. So the ones that do well for the uh, mammals uh, also do well for the juveniles. The ones that do badly for the adults also do badly for the juveniles. And of course, that is what you'd expect if the lifestyles of juveniles mirror the lifestyles of adults, which to a large extent they do. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, we then went on to look at fishes, 2015. Uh, this is an overview of what was quite a complicated analysis. Productivity of fish, uh, my measure of productivity, turns out to be measured by uh, the Bertalan VK parameter. And so uh, you can collect an immense amount of data from fish base, and we plotted it out one point per species, and overall you get a line with a negative slope. The slope here is minus 0.23, so that's near enough minus a quarter, minus 0.25, which would be the expectation from Kleiber's law. We did also in this analysis go on and um, we looked at effect, effects of temperature uh, and um, so, uh, uh, and and body size correcting for temperature. And those results are also interesting, but in the interest of time, I haven't put them in here. They, they, do, they do fit well with the metabolic theory predictions. Um, so for the last part of my talk, I'm going to consider juvenile growth. And this is something that has been puzzling me for many years <clears throat> as to why uh, juvenile growth slows as animals approach maturity. What are the physiological constraints on juvenile growth? And just to show you what the curves look like, they're almost invariably they're sigmoid in shape like this. They go up, that could almost be exponential to begin with, but then it tails off dramatically and takes a long time to reach adult size. See, what you'd expect from life history theory is if there were no constraints, then you'd expect it to go up exponentially all the way up a J curve until you hit adult size. So come up like that. And you do find exponential growth in caterpillars. But almost all organisms have this sigmoid curve. And so um, generally people fit uh, the, 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 in analyzing data, they either use the Bertalanffy equation, which is here in blue, uh, or the logistic equation here in black, or the Gompertz equation, which is, turns out to be in between here are the dashed red lines. 
And here I've plotted juvenile body mass against age. And I've centered them so that they all have the same slope uh, at uh, the midway body mass. So what the Bertalanffy equation assumes is that if you look at the rate of energy intake or outflow or growth as, a, as in relation to body mass, Bertalanffy assumes that food intake comes up as the two thirds power of body mass as the animal grows. <clears throat> but the metabolic rate for maintenance uh, goes up linearly. And to get the growth rate, DMDT, you, you look at the difference between the blue and the red. And so if you subtract them in your head, then you get up and eventually uh, the animal can't go on growing anymore because all of the energy coming in is devoted to maintenance. And that gives you the familiar Bertalanffy growth curve. So recently, over the last few years, I've been puzzling about this, I have to say, going around in circles for a fair amount of time. And so studying diagrams like this that look at what happens in a cap capillary, and you have the red blood cells, which uh, they go out across the wall of the capillary and supply oxygen to the surrounding cells. But in the end, I finished with, a, I'm afraid, a simplified model in which the nutrient input to the capillaries is coming in at a rate proportional to mass to the two thirds, just like it did for, just like it did for uh, Bertalanffy. So that's the nutrient input into a capillary comes in at mass to the two thirds. Nutrients, including oxygen, leave the capillary to supply the cells. And I'm assuming like in that earlier graph that as the uh, juvenile grows, so it's uh, massing, so the, the supply of oxygen goes up as mass to the three quarters. And out of this terribly simple model, you get a growth curve which is horrendous. So don't look at that. So instead, I plot it out. And you see that this new model of ours, which is the dash green line, it's actually remarkably close to the blue curve, the Bertalanffy curve. So in a way, the conclusion of all this is it doesn't make much difference from the point of view of the growth curve if you stay with the original Bertalanffy assumption, maintenance metabolic rate goes up linearly, or if you stick with the metabolic ecology, that it goes up as mass to the two thirds power. So, if only we had an explanation of mass to the three quarters, <coughs> then that would give a satisfactory explanation of why growth slows as the animal approaches maturity. So my conclusions are that uh, other things being equal, selection acts to increase growth or increase productivity or increase survivorship, but there are constraints. And what are those physiological constraints? There's been a huge amount of theoretical analysis since the West et al. paper, but there's nothing has achieved the conceptual simplicity that they had. And ultimately, that's what I would most like to be able to generate because uh, that, 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 that to me would be intellectually the most satisfying type of explanation. So it remains for me to thank uh, people at the University of New Mexico I had a wonderful 10 years uh, working with these guys. Early on, I worked with Peter Kahlo, who inspired me to get into physiological ecology, and a number of colleagues at Reading, and Shai Mari, now at the University of Tel, Tel Aviv. So, thank you very much. Thank you for a really nice presentation.
We have time for a few questions, but before that, I want to remind you that the first oral communication, which is about heart rate and movement in brown bear, starts in five minutes, and you can go to that from the conference hub or your calendar if you have it there. Um, the first question, and please submit any questions you have now, it's still time. Uh, the first question is, how relevant do you think that mass specific rates are for studying ecological consequences for animals? Because the total values, i.e. energy requirements will be greater in a large animal than in a small one, despite its lower mass specific rate. Can you say that again, Alina? Maybe, maybe it's easier in two parts. Um, how relevant do you think that mass specific rates are for studying uh, ecological consequences. So I think they mean how relevant is it in the wild? Well, I think it's hugely important. I mean, um, we, we compiled uh, a couple of dozen case studies in our book from 2012, the Metabolic Ecology book, and, and that shows how if, if you work out the implications of master the three quarters, okay, it's not always three quarters, but if you work out the implications in the wild, then um, it, 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 has it has implications all over the place. There's, there's, uh, there's um, energy equivalence, this idea that the, 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 the well-established idea that the energy flow through ecosystems uh, is guided by these uh, mass dependent constraints, just to give one example. And then the next question we have is, is there an understanding of why humans have rapid growth at maturity? It seems opposite to other organisms. Rapid growth at maturity. Well, of course, we do have a, a growth spurt at, when is it, a puberty. But, um, if you take an overview, then humans follow a, a sigmoid curve like, like other animals. Uh, so um, I don't really have, well, I haven't anything else to say about that. I had a question. When you were calculating adult pro productivity and the biomass of the offspring, is that at what like I imagine there's a huge mortality in offspring so I kind of wonder at what point do you calculate the biomass of the offspring? Uh, that is a very good question and so we relied on um, uh, published data sets of which there are quite a few now for all sorts of uh, groups of animals but they tend to take the, uh, the sizes and the growth rates and so on from captive studies. And so um, in most of my work, I'm afraid we've ignored the, the, the differences in, in mortality rates. Although uh, in the mammals, I have in some studies looked at weaning mass. So that means that mortality before weaning is uh, account, accounted for to some extent. Uh, we got a, another question. This is my first time to hear of ecological physio physiology. I am a member of the British Ecological Society and I am happy to know that moving forward will be easier now that Professor Richard has introduced this area. I would love to connect with you. And he has the email address so I could connect <laughs> you later. Okay, that wasn't a question, but thank you <laughs> for sending that. Yes, please, people do email me if, if you'd like to discuss further. I mean, you know, there's a lot to play for, to my mind, in this area. I've been working in it for some 20 years and I feel I've failed to, to supply some of the fundamental answers. So please folks, go ahead, don't worry about me. 